We are going to tackle the question of where is the venture capital for women in digital news. Our panelists will explore VC trends and how to get more women into and through the VC pipeline. Our moderator for this panel is Adora Udoji. She is a global storyteller, entrepreneur, and occasional angel investor. She recently launched Out Loud Inc., a digital and technology public speaking platform. Please join me in welcoming Adora and our panel. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's been a day where I know my head is just buzzing around and so much stuff flying around. I'm like, I can try this, I can try that, interesting point. So I know you're gonna, we're gonna wind it up with a real bang because we're gonna talk about money, and not only money, but big money, which is venture capitalists. And we have the most extraordinary panel. And you know, I, I, I keep joking that I just wish we had a flash drive that we could just connect to their brains and all download because of the wisdom that's sitting here and the perspective and the experience that they're gonna share with us this afternoon. So what we're hoping to do, because we also had a, a call earlier, is just give you um, some context for uh, venture capital funding and give you some things to think about or some do's and some don'ts if you're considering it or you know other people. One thing that I would like to do before we start though is just get a rough sense of who's in our audience because I know that I've spoken to many of you and it's a real cross section of people. So educators, raise your hand. Entrepreneurs. Mm. You're in the right room. Are you in corporate corporations as, as in uh, uh, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs or are you outside of corporates. Bootstraps, okay, bootstraps, all right. So you're right, you're in the right place for the money. Okay, so sitting next to me here is Fran Hauser. She is a partner at Rothenberg Ventures, which is a venture capitalist firm. And before that, she was a longtime senior leader in digital media, both at Time Inc. as well as at AOL. And next to her, we have Harlan Mandel, who's the CEO of Media Development Investment Fund. He runs uh, a mission-driven investment fund, providing low-cost financing to independent news media in countries where the free press is under threat. And sitting next to Harlan is Natalia Oberti Noguera, who is the founder and CEO of the Pipeline Fellowship, which is an angel investment boot camp for women. Her Show them your t-shirt, Natalia. Oh, this is what I do. Some, I'm a visual person, and some people have a hard time knowing what I'm doing, so I'm changing the face of angel investing. She's changing the face of angel investing. And she's gonna talk a little bit about pipeline, as we heard from the prior conversation about seed funding a bit. And sitting next to Natalia is Stacy Donahue, who leads Omidyar Network's Government Transparency Initiative, following a very distinguished career in senior leadership at Hewlett Packard as well as other places. So really thrilled to have all of you here for this discussion. And we're gonna leave plenty of time for questions at the end, because I know you guys are all warmed up after the previous panel. Mm -hmm. So what I thought we'd do is first set the context and what I'd like for each of you from your vantage point is to describe what is a digital news venture backable compi company in your estimation and what are the kinds of investments are you seeing in this space? And then we'll talk specifically about women. Fran? Okay. So what I would say is I, I, I really like seeing proprietary technology or a first to market experience. Um, and so what I mean by that is on the proprietary technology side, I think a great example is Brian Goldberg, who was the founder, actually co-founder of Bleacher Report, and he created this technology and platform when he was there um, that really allowed them to drive a huge amount of traffic to Bleacher Report. And you know, through social media optimization, and search engine optimization, and multivariate testing, and all these different things, and they pieced it all together. And he then took that playbook and he created this women's lifestyle site called Bustle.com, which is already at 20 million monthly unique visitors after a year. Um, and it was because of that proprietary technology, right? So I, I love seeing technology. Um, and then when I say a first to market kind of user experience, I'm thinking of something like Flipboard, where that was a first to market, right? If you, if you think about that experience and the way that you can consume content um, through Flipboard, there, there's nothing else like that. So that's really appealing to me. If you don't have proprietary technology or a first to market user experience, um, and it's just really straight content, 
then I think it's really important to have a strong personality behind the content um, or to be serving an underserved market. I think you know millennial women or even Gen Y women, great example of an underserved market where there are so many brands that have big marketing budgets that they want to spend against those audiences, but there's just there aren't that many media properties where they can do that. Um, so that, that's, that's what I would say. And Harlan, you look at these things radically differently. Do you good. want to describe to us what to you would be something <coughs> that your fund would back, or has backed for that matter? So, so we work in places that you know, historically um, credible, high quality, independently produced news and information is hard to come by. So we're looking for companies that are, are producing that kind of content and in a way, their competitive advantage is really the trust relationship that they build with their audience around that content. Um, and for most of the projects we finance, that's, that's the biggest driver. And then uh, with that, in particularly in the digital space, you know, there, there needs to be um, a lot of, I, I like what Jake said about having a, a hustler, a hacker, um, and uh, 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 a storyteller and a designer as part of any founding team and looking at as a company scales up being able to develop those capacities each one of those uh, in a robust of, a robust enough way to turn it into a business you know where I think there are a lot of companies and 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 uh, organizations that provide some very strong storytelling turning that into a business requires the other functionality around it and Stacey I'm gonna go to you first and then Natalia just because you invest. <laughs> sure, so um, I think it really depends on what you think of as the definition of venture capital. Um, at Omidy, our network, we're a philanthropic investment firm that was started by the founder of eBay uh, and his wife. And um, we do both uh, impact investing and nonprofit grant making and a variety of things in between, really focused on empowering individuals and in one of the areas we work uh, we call it governance and citizen engagement um, independent media plays a big role so for us we're looking at accountability journalism in digital form um, as the focus and there um, there are some models that are venture backable to, to use your terminology and you know that typically means as I think Jake was mentioning earlier a uh, hundred million dollar business um, in five years time roughly um, there are some of those, but I would say that um, there are lots of other uh, journalism models that are financeable. Maybe they're not $100 million businesses, but they can be self-sustaining and they can be profitable. And most importantly for us, they can have social impact. So we're generally talking about just post-product. You've devised a product. You've built it. You've tested the market in some way or what same thing with the service. You have some sort of market traction. Mm -hmm or you have some sense of credibility in terms of your content that you're creating in a place where there is very little access. So generally those would be the things that the three of you would have in common when you're looking at something. And then the weight of impact might be different for Fran than say for you, Stacy. So Fran, do you wanna talk about social impact and whether that's an element of what Rothenberg would consider? Yeah. You know, it's interesting on a personal level, I'm very interested in, in social impact. Um, when I look at the type of angel investing that I do, if you look at my portfolio, um, you know, I would say probably 70% of what I've invested in, there is a social impact. With Rothenberg Ventures, it's really, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't play, social impact doesn't really, doesn't play into the equation because we have limited partners, right? We have people who have entrusted us with their money um, and, and their objective is to make a financial return. So we're really more focused, as Stacy said earlier, on the, the 100x, you know, anywhere from 10x to 100x return. Anora, I wanted to take your question and, and look at it from a different perspective because we're, here we had definitions on what you're looking for as companies. And so over and over again, one of the main key characteristics that investors talk about, you know, when they talk about who they decide to invest is the team, the person. And so I have a, I'm wondering, how many of you have a journalism or reporter or publishing background? Okay, great, I'm speaking to you. Um, so I've had the great opportunity to judge uh, pitch events through Ali Joseph and Doug Mitchell's New You Accelerator. How, how many of you have heard of that one? 
great, yeah, at ONA, <laughs> at, at different um, other journalism uh, conferences. And one of the things that I keep seeing over and over again from these journalists turned entrepreneurs is that they have a very specific skill set that a lot of other newbie entrepreneurs don't have, and that's that they have the research skills. And so kind of like turning it around and providing something that you know, venture capitalists are often looking for and just giving you a little bit of, hey, you have this edge, is that you have a really great opportunity. Um, well, I'll take it. I've already given you the kudos. Now let me tell you the pet peeve that I see. So when I judge a lot of these pitch events, so many of the entrepreneurs will say, well, my idea is so disruptive. No one has ever thought about it. I have no competition. I'm like first to market advantage. And I'm like, really? Uh, and instead, what I have noticed whenever I hear pitches from uh, reporters turned journalists is that they know the market. They know the landscape. They've done the research. And they understand who the five to seven players are out there, what those people are doing, and how the product that they're looking to um, you know, work on, launch, et cetera, what that white space is and how they can add value. I think just, just to follow on to that, mm -hmm. I, think, you know, I think the other thing um, that journalists have, and you know, when I think of Adora, you definitely have this, is you can tell a story. And I think you know, the, the pitch, when you think about the pitch, so much of it is, is a story, and it's that emotional connection. Um, so I think that's a huge advantage that you all have. And I, I also feel like when I look at the types of founders that we invest in, I love investing in founders who are coming from the industry that they're trying to disrupt. Mm -hmm. Because you, you really know it. You know it inside and out. And, um, you know, and, and we, we look at the sum of kind of all of your life experiences that have brought you to this point and why you are doing what you're doing. So I think just you know, just to follow on, I, I think that's also a positive that, that you guys come from that background. But if any of the, in the women in here who started a venture, at what point, the story is critical. I mean, Coke has sort of figured that out over the last couple of decades that telling a story works when you're marketing. But for entrepreneurs who are starting something new and they're thinking about, I want to build a company where I want to go seek venture capitalists money and I want to be successful in doing that. There are certain steps. There's lots wrong and we'll sort of get to some of those challenges with the system in regards to women. But what does it take just to get to the door to know that you're knocking on the right door for the right funding source? Which would be the venture capitalist money which is very different than a fellowship or an accelerator mm -hmm. or friends and family money. Mm -hmm. So it was just, so we, when we sort of talk about that, what yeah. is that mean for you guys before you'll write a check to one of these women who are launching a digital news company. I can speak to that. Um, so, you know, I see a lot of pitches and the things that really stand out for me the most are exactly the storytelling. So, Fran, I, I completely agree with you. Um, but I also need to understand some really salient points. So, first of all, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Why are you better equipped to solve it than anybody else? Who else is out there trying to solve it? Because there certainly is somebody else out there. Um, how much money do you need to solve the problem, or at least to get you, you know, started? Um, and what are you going to use the money for? And specifically, I need to hire, you know, two engineers and one salesperson, et cetera. So for me, those are the kind of the critical pieces of information. Um, and then from, from your side, from the entrepreneur's side, one thing I wanted to emphasize as you're thinking about where to find venture capital is to be creative in how you tell your story. Um, there are lots of firms out there that maybe say, well, we don't do media, um, but they might do um, a certain country that you have a focus on, or they might do um, you know, a certain type of technology that you're using. So just um, when you have your lens, your, your sales hat on, Think about how you can appeal to your venture audience um, and, and think broadly and creatively about that. I'm just going to, uh, just a bit of a disclosure before I go to Natalia, because I think this is a perfect um, point. 
Natal, I, I graduated from Pipeline <laughs> Fund Fellowship, so I, I, I worship her and her and her vision and the exposure, the demystifying of what angel investing is what she did for me. And I, I think it's part of the process that you've been really committed to in creating a pipeline of both funding women-led ventures and also introducing women to investing and what that means is exactly what Stacy said. I think that you're very, if you could just talk about what you think is important in um, making sure that the entrepreneurs and the investors understand about what that process might look like and what you're working towards. You might have a fabulous idea, but what are you working towards to build a business as opposed to a project as we've heard other people talk about earlier today? Yeah, so, and I don't know if you've already gotten this question asked um, for the, from the earlier panel. I have a saying which is sola solopreneur. So how many of you are sola solopreneurs? And by what, by what I mean by that is one stop one person shop, you know, like that it's just you. Okay, how many of you have a team? Okay, so there, done, that's it. That one person, you need to find someone here today and, and you're closer to getting funded. Um, <laughs> what I tend to see oftentimes for particularly, and well, okay, how many of you are first time entrepreneurs? That would be the other question that I have for you. Okay, is oftentimes first time entrepreneurs, they're starting on their own and then they're going out there to pitch and they're looking to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars and they don't have the team to get them there, to scale. And so that is often a big disconnect that I see. And you, you know, one of the things that I talk about is in the funding continuum, we tend to talk about bootstrapping, then friends and family round, then angel round, then VC round. And Nicole Sanchez, she used to be at Cape or Capital. She has this very powerful um, remark that she has made in the past and she did it at one of our conferences which is an all-day event on angel investing and she said bootstrapping is glorified in the media in tech blogs etc she says for a lot of us bootstrapping is simply what we call for our communities is simply what we call living <laughs> and you know like when we think about it that way it does speak at the privilege of being able to bootstrap a company you know and and being more um, you know, if we want to be more inclusive, we need to acknowledge a lot of that. And then the second aspect of it is friends and family round. What I underscore and the reason that I launched Pipeline Fellowship, which is an angel investing bootcamp for women, is because a lot of women and a lot of men of color and a lot of LGBTQ entrepreneurs, we don't have the friends and family for the friends and family round. And so we're positioning Pipeline Fellows to serve as the friend slash family member to provide that critical capital injection to get to the next level, to hopefully scale, to hopefully get that MVP that later stage investors are looking for. And then ultimately, the idea is that we are really building this network that then can connect them to those angel investors who are strangers, who are looking to put down their own money, to then be able to have something that they can then take, hypothetically, to those VCs. So in terms of that, the, and the other aspect that we're talking about is that sure, do your homework. Go find out what all these VC firms are looking for. What, what is their like investment thesis, et cetera. Then guess what? A lot of them, they say, send, send your application or send your inquiry over here. And then a lot of times you don't ever hear back because it's so similar to um, applying for a job. A lot of times, once you see that job posting, that job has been taken. And so oftentimes, what I would just encourage you to do is, you're doing it right now. It's making it personal. You're connecting with these VCs here, and that's one step closer to differentiating yourself from all those emails and all those, like, let's call them LOIs that they're getting, you know? That, and so I'd say, like, at the end of the day, if you want to raise money, it really is about relationships and it's about you getting to meet people, whether it's angel investor, whether it's venture capitalist. And the goal of having an angel investor is that one of my favorite definitions of angel investing is that smart money, that it's not just the financial capital, it's yeah, exactly. the human capital and the social capital. So the skill sets that they can provide and also the network that they can leverage. So giving an example and putting two people on the spot, Adora meets an entrepreneur. She invests as an angel investor. It's in the digital media space. She connects them to Rothenberg Ventures because she knows Fran. That's how it works. And that's why the white guys are getting the funding because they know the white guys who are in these VC firms. Mm -hmm. And so the hope is that the more that we get more women and, and men of color on the VC side, 
And in angel investing, the more that we're going to be able to connect it to women and men of color on the entrepreneurship side. And I want to ride this notion of optimism and hope. After that. <laughs> um, in the sense of, I love what the Kauffman Foundation, I'm sure some of you have actually seen it. Kauffman Foundation, for, for those of you who may not know, is a, uh, is a nonprofit. It's, a, it's a, a, a hugely endowed organization focused on education and entrepreneurship. And they do a lot of uh, thought leadership and a lot of programmings, and they also do some invest. They have an arm that does some investing. Bottom line is they've said that this is the decade of the woman entrepreneur. Bless you. And so wh what I'd like to hear from um, Stacy Harlan and Fran is give us an example of some women entrepreneurs that you know or have heard of that have gotten investing. We know the numbers are small. And then let's talk about what some of the systematic challenges are. But, but Stacy, do you want to talk about some of the, either the ones that you guys are doing or things that you think are worth mentioning, sure. particularly in this media space? Yeah, so first of all, just to address the systematic challenges, um, completely agree with what you said, that this is such a relationship business. Um, and, uh, and it's a business of funding proven entrepreneurs. And so women right now are potentially disadvantaged in two ways. One, they're not already part of the networks they need to be to get the funding, and many of them are first-time entrepreneurs, and so the successful male entrepreneurs get funded again and again instead of people taking a risk on the first-time entrepreneur. Um, the, the other disadvantage is um, that, as I think has probably been discussed here, um, funders fund people who look like them. And we have a massive problem in the venture capital industry that it is very much dominated by white men. Can you talk about some of those blind studies? Yes. Yeah, so, and the blind pitches, because yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. So um, HBS did, Harvard Business School did um, studies recently that showed that when a business plan is evaluated um, with a male name attached to it uh, by a panel of judges, which can be both men and women, by the way, um, that plan gets voted for funding much more often when there's a male name attached to it than when there's a female name attached to it. Right? There, there is incredible gender bias that's unconscious by, again, both men and women um, towards female entrepreneurs. So, you know, that is, uh, I don't mean to, to get off the hope and optimism, because I also think there is a lot of that. Um, but I think we should recognize and, and vocalize that that is a major problem in the venture industry. And in order to solve the problem of getting uh, the right representation of female entrepreneurs, we have to get the right representation of females in venture capital so, and people of color. So, you know, that's one of the systemic challenges. On but the, just to, but on top of that is yeah. media coverage too. I mean, I love this. There's this great quote from Melissa Bell, who's a co-founder of Vox. I'm sure many of you know where she says that the Guardian story talked about Vox as, you know, Ezra Klein being the sort of the, the person who founded it and, and launched it. But despite media narratives, as I'm reading from this, despite media narratives that have erased her from the equation, Bell is an equal co-founder. And she says, she's quoted as saying, I should say, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing, she says. Is it the media's fault for picking up on Ezra? Is it my fault for not speaking up? So I just wondered what and I you'd think there's Ezra also could be at fault there, because there could be many media opportunities that are being sent to him. And he's like, yes, 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 and said, oh, you know, actually, you take this one, mm -hmm. or you take another one. It really is about um, everyone, um, Rachel Sklar, you know, I've heard this was the first time that I ever heard it. She's the founder of well, both the Change the Ratio movement and the list. She talks about that saying of um, a rising tide lifts all boats, you know, and mm -hmm. it really is not necessarily who's at fault. It's like acknowledging it and coming together. I guess it just stuck out to me that the, it's the sort of the, the media bias of always calling the man. And this is not just in this scenario, apparently, but I mean, I think we see it consistently, right? When we see a team of entrepreneurs and it could in include a, uh, a woman or a person of color. They're not necessarily usually the ones who are out front. And how much does that hurt? How much of, does that hurt them? And when there's, you know, how much does that does that does does that hurt the? What am I trying? You never guess. I got paid to talk for a living. Um, <laughs> good God. <laughs> I guess there's two separate things that are happening here, right? One is the systematic 
you know, exclusion, unconscious bias. I think Brad Feld, who's the you know, famous mm -hmm. VC, put it best. I, he was talking about it once recently. The problem with it is that it's unconscious. So it's like, how do you attack right. you know, what that is? But at the end of their day, there are some companies that are run by women. And Harlan, you talked about this, particularly legacy companies, right? Print and um, broadcast, who are further along, who are more, who are, have gotten venture capitalist funding. So, so let me start with a little bit about us. So I'm, first of all, I guess I got the secret pass from Jake to pass it to me. <laughs> panel, and I appreciate it. But as an organization, so on our standing investment committee, I'm actually the only guy. So uh, there are four of us. Our chief investment officer is a woman. Our chief operating officer is a woman. Our general counsel is a woman. That's right. um, most of our people, regional people, who are kind of key for generating deal flow, for Latin America, for Asia, for Eastern Europe, for uh, the CIS, are all women. Um, and uh, I think even, even more than that, I think we all know, and we talk about this in our investment committee, that you know, women generally make better clients for us. Right? So it's, it's uh, not a new re uh, revelation. So the whole microcredit industry is built on the fact that women are much better borrowers mm -hmm. than men. They're much more reliable. Um, for a host of reasons, and as you go up the food chain of companies, it also holds true. Um, there are, I mean, all of our clients, both men and women, I think are pretty incredible, and uh, they, they do incredible things, and you can't overgeneralize by gender. But all that being said, you know, we as an organization feel that our women clients have generally uh, managed risk better and have been more reliable over the long haul. So uh, I think we're very predisposed as an organization for women-run companies. But that being said, um, our numbers you know, don't, don't quite correlate with that assumption. So we have about 29% of us. We currently, in our, we're, we're providing financing for 62 companies. And um, out of that 62 companies, 29% are, uh, have women in the ownership, in the founding ownership. Uh, uh, that's high, by the way. It's yeah. high. It's but, depressing that it's but, high. But, that, but that's what's depressing, <laughs> right? Exactly. Like, yeah. right? And if you look at who's running the company, so we define that as either uh, the chief executive officer or if it's uh, run by a board, uh, a majority of the board are women. So that's 25%. When you take our digital portfolio, so companies that are in the digital space, um, native digital news organizations, uh, it gets worse. Actually, and what's interesting is those are our more recent uh, clients. So somehow there's 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 a degradation going on over time, whether that is, you know, some historical thing or whether that is a cultural issue as we as our the countries we work in shift, um, or uh, or it's something inherent in in uh, digital media. Uh, the numbers are a little worse. So out of 16 companies, four uh, have women founders. Uh, three have women chief executives. Um, what kind of investments are we talking? A hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars? So our investments range, you know, at the smallest size, twenty-five thousand dollars. On the largest size, you know, five million dollars. So we, we cover a pretty large range of investments, a very large range of companies. Uh, for digital startups, we're generally um, between you know twenty-five thousand and six hundred thousand dollars. And you, you, you've all mentioned the network. So how do you, I mean, to your point, Natalia, like, what have you seen? I want to give you guys something to walk out of here and just be able to hit the ground, because this stuff is rough. It's rough. It's rough. What have you seen as a, is effective? What's the tactic? I don't know how many times I've, I mean, I've invested in several companies, and so I deal with a variety of different investors. The, wor the warm introduction, yeah. right? Because there's so much, I'm sure, Stacy, how many emails do you get every week? I don't even know, but I'm always calling our IT administrator to ask him to increase my storage because I'm constantly you know, up against it. And so I how mean, to cut huge. through, what are some tactics, what are some of the best tactics that you've seen? Because whether you're applying for a fellowship, whether you're an accelerator, whether you're trying to contact a VC, you're trying to get your hands on any funding source, it can be very challenging. Yeah. So I mean, it, what have you yeah. seen in sort of that early, and let's, let's march up I to that, like $5 million is a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, it just occurred to me that we haven't brought up a very specific 
point, and it's a gendered one, and it's uh, founder syndrome. And just talking about how I have noticed that founder syndrome, or at least specifically, um, I want to own my entire company. I tend to see that much more from women entrepreneurs. And one of the best quotations that I ever heard from, and she's actually a Yale is Min Yi. You know Smorgas Chef? Have you seen those, that restaurant chain in New York City? So before she started, she's a serial entrepreneur as well, before she started Smorgas Chef, she, uh, Min Yi, in the early 2000s, she built an online design school and she sold it and she ended up to sign an NDA, a non-compete, so she was like, what do I do now? Oh, I've, I'll start restaurants. This is what she said, she said, would you rather own 100% of nothing or 1% of something huge? And so I'm just bringing this up even to start the conversation because sometimes people are concerned about even talking about with VCs because they're concerned about giving some stake of their company to someone else. And so that's also maybe a question for all of you in terms of what do you want, like what do you see yourselves so in terms of as an entrepreneur, what sort of company do you want to build? And because I'm the, my yin to my own yang, I will share with you a book called The Big Enough Company, which is from Adelaide Lancaster and Amy Abrams. And in that, uh, in that book, they also talk about how there's this huge pressure from the media, from everyone to um, tell women entrepreneurs, you have to be high growth, high performing companies. And guess what? Some of us might be interested in that and some of us might actually love whatever size our company is. And so they wanted to also so validate whichever size of business you want to have, that that's okay too. However, if you really do want to build a high growth you know, company, then you need to be comfortable bringing others on board and what that means when you're no longer the only person um, you know, owning your company, because that's, that's a conversation we hadn't had yet. And then the other aspect that I did want to bring up, because you mentioned microfinance, is I do have to it was, it was like positive for a second and then I'll make it like depressing. Actually, now that microfinance is becoming a business, we're seeing that the percentage of microfinance-backed companies that are women-led is decreasing. So what does that mean? As soon as it became a business, oh, well, what, what people and who is running the company and who, uh, is, is a different conversation. And the one thing that I, um, I wanted to share with you is a study, in case you're interested in it. It's an old study, unfortunately, it's still relevant. It's from Illuminate Ventures. It's from like in 2000. And um, she was talking about how the, the study showcased that um, whenever there were women partner VCs, there were the deal flow that was seen and also the number of companies that this VC firm would invest in had higher uh, percentage of women entrepreneurs. And so the assumption was that of course, that woman VC partner, she's leading all these deals. She's going out there getting the women entrepreneurs and investing in them. And what they realized was that actually, that woman VC partner was simply a symbol of the culture of the VC firm because her male partner VCs, they actually respected women enough to have them as colleagues, to have them at the partner level that they themselves understood the value of investing in women entrepreneurs. So then that's sort of like serving as a beacon, which we know that, as you would say, language matters, pictures are very powerful. Let's assume that there's an entrepreneur in this room who wants to build a high growth company. Fran, what is the most, what is the best way for them to try to get to you to make yeah. that pitch? Yeah, so I think um, going back to your point of the warm intro, it, it really is everything because I get more than a thousand emails a week. And if it's a cold, you know, just a cold email or on LinkedIn, I'm probably not gonna be able to get, to get back to you. So, I think one but of the things that's really- But how do I get really, around that? Because we've already identified yep. that for women, for yep. people of color, we don't tend to have those same networks where we don't yeah. have access where we can call somebody yeah. and say, hey, can you give me $25,000? Yeah. Well, look, I think it, it actually really starts with, you have, to, you have to look at which venture capital firms are investing in companies that are similar to yours. You really do have to start there. You have to identify those people. And then you have to go through LinkedIn and like really work your network to find 
do I have a connection? It might be like literally like two or three connections down, but you have to figure out a way to get an introduction to that person. Um, or if you really can't get an introduction, then you may want to just send an email to me, you know, through LinkedIn and say, we have these mutual connections, like put that in the, the header, because then at least I'm seeing a name that I recognize, you know, but I, I really think like working your network, working really hard to find a connection is critical because we're all just getting so many emails and it's really just impossible to get to get through it all. Yeah. Stacy, you're shaking your head. Yeah, I completely agree. I'd also say um, maybe not just you know, pick up the phone or email and say, can I have $25,000? I know you're joking when you say that, but um, I really appreciate it when people connect with me, not just about asking for money, um, but for just asking for another connection or advice or, hey, I'd just like to bounce something off of you. Um, and it does need to be a warm call because otherwise it's overwhelming. But, um, but I really appreciate people who take the time to build a relationship so it's not just about a checkbook, but about mutually understanding each other's objectives and goals. And um, I can think of several entrepreneurs I've funded who you know, reached out the first time and, and what they were doing was not a fit. Um, and, but we had a great conversation and I said, I'm sorry it isn't a fit for these reasons. And they kept the relationship going. I think women are very good at relationship building, so we should use that to our advantage. Um, have the thick skin, as Deborah was talking about earlier, that rejection is not personal. It's just about fit, a strategic fit, or business model, or something else. And keep the relationship going, because if this idea isn't a fit, the next one might be, or your idea might shift over time. And I've definitely invested in a couple of things that weren't a fit at first, and two years later, they were a fit. You, you bring up I, a really I big. Oh, just one thing. You bring up a really good point about this. Is the other thing, right? Not every company is mm -hmm. like a match for venture right. capitalists. I think yeah. there's sort of been some glorifying of it. Right. I'm going to start a company and I'm going to get some yeah. VC money. Yeah. But can you? Yes. Do you want to speak to Stacey? Just want to finish your thought because you were sort of going there. I mean, not every like to the point. You have a conversation with someone. You're like, okay, maybe there's some other funding sources that make sense for you for where you are right now. Absolutely, um, and particularly in media where there is this kind of broad range of opportunities, some of which are purely commercial, some of which are purely um, for the public interest, and then things that are in between. Um, there can be a variety of funding sources that might not be readily apparent if you're just kind of doing online research, but through relationships and knowing people who have an interest um, in funding things that may be somewhere on that spectrum can be really useful. But it, it does take time and it takes relationship building. But I, again, I just want to emphasize that I think women are very good at that. And um, many more women have continued to build relationships with me over time them than men. Uh, and I think there is something to this, you know, rejection. If I reject something, um, you know, I can get the reaction perhaps from a man saying, oh, well, you don't know what you're talking about, and I'm going to go somewhere else and get my money. Um, but many of the women I've interacted with have said, thank you for your feedback. Um, I really appreciate that. I'm going to think about it. And, um, and then they come back with something different, and it works. So uh, I think we should just, you know, use, use that to our mutual advantage. I also think when you're in bootstrapping mode, I don't know how much you talked about crowdfunding today, but um, there's also a site called Patreon, um, which is all about funding creative projects. So that might be a platform that, that you, know, you could all look at. And again, because you're journalists and you're amazing storytellers, it feels like you would have an advantage um, over others when it comes to crowdfunding because you'd be able to tell an incredible story through, through video. I want to say you were going to say something. You, yeah, like there's this whole point about the connections, connections, and I wanted to normalize it because yes, you might actually several of you, and I'm going to put friend on the spot again, might not have ever known friend. Tonight you go on LinkedIn and you realize that you didn't know anyone who could have connected you with her. Guess what? You can meet her today. And so something that <laughs> I, you know, Fran something, Hauser right some, here. you know, something that I, um, you know, I speak at a lot of conferences and, you know, we here, I'm going to already put ourselves out. Like we offer business cards. We say, contact us. And before I get out of the room, so many times, and especially like if it's like a diversity conference or a women's in business conference, the first email before I get, before I leave the venue, is from the random white guy who was attending. And you know, oftentimes it's because the women entrepreneurs, the men of color entrepreneurs say, 
all of these speakers are probably so busy, you're not gonna have time to connect with us. And guess what, yeah, we are. We might have, you, you might email us, we might not reply on the first time, the second time, you know, you might ping us as well. What I bring it back to is what, um, Toya Powell, she used to be at the US Black Chambers Inc. Used, loves to say, which is, fortune is in the follow-up. So you connect, you know, you collect our five business cards and you have the choice of either not emailing us or of emailing us. And if you think, oh my gosh, they're not gonna have enough time, that at least your chances are higher if you do email us, that at least one of us will reply. So I will, you know, I just want to leave you with that, which is fortune is in the follow-up, and that's by Toya Powell. And okay, even we're gonna, if we okay, don't go ahead. reply, um, your name is, you know, yeah. in the, the ether, and I find so many times that I'll get an email from someone, and then, you know, someone else will mention them, and it kind That's of true. piles on, and then, you know, eventually, um, you have the opportunity to meet and, and have more substantive conversations. So it's always worth sending the email. Critical mass. Um, we're going to open it up to questions, and while we do, we're going to get in my optimism. Kaufman Foundation said it's the decade of the woman entrepreneur, and I'd love for each of you to speak to one thing that you see changing, shifting, or one thing that you would point to as encouraging to fulfilling that aspiration. Fran, I'll just go down, and we'll yeah, just wait till. Does anybody have any questions? And she's yeah. got the mic. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So what what I'm loving right now is just all of the activity around women supporting women. And I feel like, you know, whether it's Rachel Sklar's The List, mm. as you pointed out, or Pipeline, um, or even Dreamers and Doers, which is Women 2.0. Right, Women 2.0, Dreamers and Doers, which is this amazing um, Facebook group for, for female entrepreneurs. I do, I do see this, like women supporting women. There's a movement, and I, and I, I get, you know, calls from more and more organizations um, all the time, you know, asking me to get involved. So I, I feel like there's this, this this movement and this activity and this trend that um, that can catalyze this. Somebody has a mic, I believe. I do. Uh, I'd like to ask whether the panelists see any kind of transfer for media ventures overseas, not in this country, because there. Uh, I, of course, Omidyar and MDIF are both involved in helping, but you know, you're re relatively small characters compared to the VCs in Silicon Valley, and you're very valuable to all of us. But I'm wondering whether you see any kind of trend of social investing that's moving overseas, and more competition in the field to look at promising media startups because we're finding at ICFJ we're trying to create accelerators and and different contests to try to attract that type of investing and I'm wondering if you see that see that kind of trend because it's hard enough in this country for the women to get in front of the VCs and now we're talking about yet another level of complexity when there is no VC culture in the developing world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you want as the international so, representative so I would say you know, first of all the, the encouraging trend is that um, I think there is increasing investment from the VC sector in media. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I think finally we're starting to see business models take shape in digital media that seem to be getting traction. So on the one hand, I think that's, that's a good development. On the other hand, it's going to be targeting you know, really the, the top of the food chain in a way. You know, the, the companies that are truly scalable as much as possible in the kind of BuzzFeed Mike, vein. Mike.com. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. exactly, mm -hmm. and the the and that doesn't disparage those kinds of news organizations. I think you know a, a lot of them are providing incredibly valuable content, um, and they figured out how to do it in a very very effective way. Um, but there are only so many that you can have in one place, right? And there's a lot of other kinds of content that is of value that you know we're interested in supporting, um, uh, and that I'm sure a lot of you are interested in producing that doesn't quite fit that mold and is not going to be suitable for VC funding, because it's not gonna have the kind of scalability you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And I, you need to be realistic yeah. about that. Yeah. So as a half Italian, half Colombian, I was invited to be part of an investor entrepreneur delegation um, by the Aspen Institute back to Colombia, and it was the first time that I had been there in several years. And it was also the first time that I realized that I'm not only am I an LGBTQ Latina, I realized through Aspen that I'm part of the Colombian diaspora. Like, I hadn't ever thought about it myself that way. And um, we were having a conversation on angel investing, and of course I brought up Pebble and Fellowship and what we're doing to increase diversity. Um, you know, of U.S. angel investors and a white woman, a U.S. white woman who was actually leading, had, you know, organized it and planned it through her organization who had invited me. 
she kind of like at the end, she was like, well, you know, in Colombia, we were in Medellin at the time, you know, we really actually don't even have an angel investing community. So I think we're a little bit too far ahead for Pipeline Fellowship to even come because I had mentioned that some Colombian women entrepreneurs had said, you have to come. And I looked at her and I said, you know, actually this is the greatest time for us to come here because if we haven't yet started a culture that is pretty like male dominated, how great that we start a culture at the beginning that is inclusive. And it was like this light bulb had just turned on her head. Like she hadn't thought about that about it that way, she had thought, oh, we need to kind of follow this prescriptive model of what we know has happened in other places such as the US, and then we can correct, we can correct for it, you know, and, and so my You're hope like, is let's that. let's just get it right from the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> right. you Here's know? a thought, right. Um, if I could just add one point about another um, in investor group that might be worth exploring is um, impact investing as a sector is um, growing uh, greatly and particularly uh, in Europe uh, and I, I think it's an unexplored area for media um, when I have talked to impact investors um, who look at things like water sanitation etc um, they're not thinking about media as that combination of a high growth business with impact uh, and so I, I think that's something that everyone who is looking for funding should also be exploring in addition to the usual suspects. I saw there was another hand or as I Okay. Okay. Hi, I have a question. When you talk about scale, how many users should somebody have before they approach somebody for VC investment as opposed to a seed stage investment? And um, okay, I'll, I'll let I'll leave it at that one first. I'm thinking. You know, it's it's hard because there's so many different variables. I mean, we definitely want to see traction. So, like for for VC, there needs to be a product. Um, that's out there, and you know we'd like to see. Um, it depends if it's a niche play or a mass play. I mean, if, if it's a if it's a mass news play, I think we'd probably want to see something around a few hundred thousand monthly unique visitors. Um, you know, to really kind of prove product market fit. Um, if it's a niche play, it, it could be smaller than that. But again, th this is at the VC level. I think. At the angel level, it, it could be less than that, right, mm -hmm. Natalia? Yeah, I mean, and I was going to say the well, other aspect is it could be zero. It could be zero. Oh, it, the angel, yeah. yeah. Well, and it also is what also matters is what sort of revenue streams do you have, right? Because to the to why just to clarify the niche play and the mass play, because let's just say that you actually have a freemium model, right? So like you actually are able to you know make more money if you do have like a loyal user base, et cetera, versus if you're like still going for the ad supported, you know? Yeah. So that's also in terms of how disruptive your own uh, platform is, that that also plays a role into it. I think yeah. there might also be some cultural differences between East Coast venture capital firms and West mm -hmm. Coast, and Fran, I don't know if you'd yeah. agree with this, um, yeah. but my observation is East Coast firms tend to focus more quickly on the business model and the revenue generation, and West Coast firms on the growth of the user base. Um, and so it goes back to that, how do you pitch your story um, to, to best suit your audience? Oh, which goes and, back and, to the yeah. research that right. Natalia yeah. talked about, which also goes back to the fact that so many of these definitions are changed. What is social impact investment? Yeah. Yes. I mean, it, there's not sort yes. of a, 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 a universal reference point to what that is, yeah. right? Or even what the, where the lines are in terms of what angel versus VC funding. And I think any kind of testing that you can do to prove that there is an appetite for consumers to pay for this content um, is really, really helpful at that point. You know, you don't, you don't need to be generating a, a ton of revenue, um, but I think showing that there is an appetite for consumers to pay, um, because if it is just an ad-based model, then I think it really does go back to are you serving an underserved market? Do you, do you know? So. And I do want to go back to the culture, and especially this is obviously US-based. I will be provocative, and I will bring up something that you were quite diplomatic, and you, we did not go into the nitty gritty in terms of the West Coast and East Coast. So I, what I have seen is that in the West Coast, there are a lot more 
serial entrepreneurs turned angels or turned VC partners. And so that sense of founder friendliness is much more, you, you can sense it over there. Whereas in the East Coast, there are a lot of people who are coming from financial services. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the risk profile they have, it's very different you know, than someone who has been an entrepreneur, you know, has done it, you know, bought the t-shirt, you know, and, um, <laughs> and is now on the other side. What I will say, because to that's remind you or refresh your memory is that I'm a yin to my own yang. Yes, that's great. So yay, West Coast. Now guess what? One of the one of my um, reasonings when I hear about how New York City is one of the best, if not the best cities for female founders, like why is that the case? Why? My take is because we're kind of new. And so in terms of the culture of the people who are starting to invest, whether it's VC firms, whether it's angel investors, there isn't that many of what um, I think, Stacey, you mentioned of the you know, serial entrepreneur. And so in the West Coast, you see the buddies who are investing, and by buddy, I mean white guys, um, the buddies who are investing in like their other buddies, and they want to prove traction. You know, and so sometimes entrepreneurs are also co-investing in each other because they want to prove this new disruptive space Whereas here, because people are, you know, on the investing side are also slightly newer, let's say, then I, my take is that's why they're friendlier also to the slightly newer entrepreneurs who tend to be women, who tend to be men of color, who tend to be LGBTQ. I Just also quick, think, just one, one more really quick thing, I think that um, women, female entrepreneurs tend to be more marketing focused or more consumer focused. Um, as opposed to tech, like if you look at their at their skill sets, they're coming more from a, a marketing or a consumer focus as opposed to technology. I and I think there's more of an appreciation for the for um, the effectiveness and the importance of storytelling and marketing and really understanding the consumer. I think you have more of that in New York than you do in Silicon Valley, which Silicon Valley tends to be very one dimensional in terms of tech and really appreciating tech. We have so time for thing. one more question for one lucky person. Oh, somebody's got the mic. Go ahead. Thanks so much. Um, I'm Dia Olapade. I'm the author of a book about innovation Hi from Dia. Africa. Hi, Dora. How are you doing? Um, I have, I'll sneak in two questions, one about content, one about publishing, and really looking to your sort of perspective as people who see macro trends. On the content side, what's the difference between media and entertainment, uh, or news and entertainment, let's say? Uh, bustle versus a radio station in Zambia, as you see it, um, as an investment opportunity. And the second is, how do you deal with um, ventures that are sort of parasitic in some way on these huge tech platforms that depend on Facebook, that depend on Google? As so many of us in the room may be experiencing, you know, they're really part of your business plan. Do you discount that? Um, is, it, is it something that you give extra credit for? Is it, how do you factor that into your decisions about making investments? Okay, who wants to start? Because there's two good questions in there. Parasitic? Jump. You want to start? Um, so sure. <laughs> so that. on the parasitic point, um, you know, I, I look for things that don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and so to the extent that something can leverage existing user base um, or technology or platform, uh, I think that's generally a good thing. Um, but you have to figure out what your differentiation is and how you're going to have some power in the relationship so that you know you don't lose control of your product and your economics. Yeah. Um, but in general, um, I, I think it, it can be a good thing. Yeah, I'll just mention that if Facebook, and this has happened, or Google, somehow they change whatever sort of algorithm, and then you're dependent on that, that's not good. In terms of your question regarding entertainment and ed ed education, you know, I see a lot of ed tech because hey, social ventures. So I'm gonna approach your question in terms of branding. And so how many of you are familiar with Catch a Fire? So great, so it's actually, so let's just say it's like volunteer 2.0 meets match.com. And so what is great about them is first of all, they were led by a woman of color, Rachel Chong, so yay. And she was telling me um, when she launched that here she is, she created a for-profit social venture. However, when she was talking to investors, people didn't really get the whole picture of like how she was looking to change the world. And so she just ended up focusing on talking about her tech platform. You know, and so this goes back to who are you pitching to? Are they more interested in like the entertain entertainment lens of your company or are they more interested on your education lens? And really thinking of 
who that person that you're pitching to, what is going to perk up their interest, and also your being aware of how, what type of investor do you want? Because let's just say hypothetically you do want to mm -hmm. have like a, uh, uh, you know, like a really powerful social venture. And if you have a lot of the people who are focused on the tech platform who don't get the social impact, then at the end of the day when you're thinking about exiting, et cetera, those people will probably be counseling you in a very different way than the people who um, got into, invested in your startup because of the social impact aspect. We could talk for hours and hours. I'm being told to wrap it up, but I am going to do one last thing, which is I just want one word from each of you on your outlook for women entrepreneurs in digital news. I mean, you can do three words, but you know what I mean. Like keep it snappy and quick. Fran Hauser. Excited. Harlan. Ready. Nice. <laughs> Natalia. Bring it on. Bye. More voices. Opportunity. Opportunity. Thank you, Stacey Donahue, Natalia Alberti Noguera, Harlan Mandel, and Fran Hauser. And thank you guys. <laughs>